Forum. Borealis. Paradigm. Expansion. Greetings from the North, citizens of the world. Welcome to Forum Borealis. Our show tonight is a time capsule amidst fair porn, virus, hysteria, and a very real economic crash. And so we're departing from our usual timeless programming to bring you a show which is going to be partly dated, but also partly an evergreen, in that we're analyzing and interpreting the economic structure and philosophy of our current civilization, especially in light of the, uh, our contemporary situation. And so this show will be bumped up in the queue and released to the public ASAP. We're going to try understanding what the two dominating monetary theories contain, unveil some of the economical illusions and magic, see what it means for the plebs, you and me, debunk the how are you going to pay for it mantra keeping us in scarcity prison while the elites are on a perpetual looting party and also revisit the UBI solution since it has forced itself back on the agenda by the corona scare and the very real consequences of it such as nationwide lockdowns and an accelerated world crash which unbeknownst to the majority actually started long before the pandemic. In addition, we're also going to muse a little about mainstream politics, especially from an American angle. Now, I'll be the first to admit that my competence regarding economics is limited and basically reflected by such productions as the excellent Money as Debt, which you can find on YouTube. It's in two parts. So to help us with a better comprehension, we have Robert Bonomo back, who's a filmmaker, photographer, blogger, novelist, esoterician, financial and political analyst. His background is equally manifold. After acquiring graduate degrees from the University of Florida and Boston, And having lectured at universities in Spain and China, he had an extensive career in marketing and advertising, having worked among others for the World Wildlife Fund, UPS, Galais Lafayette, Porsche and Antevenio. Despite his successful professions, he had a change of heart, fed up with spending his energy on convincing thousands of people to buy things they don't really need or want, and decided to pick up pen and paper and begin writing. A few novels emerged along the way. All three are available as free downloads on Smashwords. Being multilingual, it's no wonder he's lived and worked all over the world, like San Francisco Bay Area, Miami, New York, in Argentina, China, Colombia, Russia, Spain, the last few years in Andorra, and recently moved to Tunisia, where he's lecturing at the university level at the school he's running. Having worked many of these places as a teacher, even giving online classes, he's coupled this experience with his passion for esoteric and started to give online tarot seminars as well as readings. He's presented his work in various conferences and the presentation has also turned into instructional and documentary movies like the two-year production released in 2018 called The 21 Faces of God, a presentation of the major arcana archetypes. Currently, he's working upon a new movie called Twilight of the Archons, which cover the financial cultural and spiritual web of control as well as offering some ways out. The release of this has been set back by the current conditions so he's updating and adjusting to them. Robert Bonomo, who is a former anarcho-libertarian, is consequently blogging on all sorts of topics. His prediction of the gold value was mentioned in Market Watch. Ron Unz included Bonomo's work in the Unz Review. 
He's had his articles published in some of the leading old and new media sites, including Business Insider, Culture, Lee Rockwell, Infowars, Global Research, The Occidental Observer, Activist Post, Rense, What Really Happened, Counterpunch, Information Clearinghouse, Activist Post, Pravda, Rinf Alternative News, The Waking Times, Astrological News Service, and The Mountain Astrologer. Robert is naturally also a frequent guest on podcasts and talk radio. Some of his guest appearances include the Higher Side Chats, Aeon Byte, Gnostic Radio, Grimerica, Where Did the Road Go, Freeman TV, Eschaton, The Outer Limits of Inner Truth, Lighting the Void, My Alchemical Bromance, and Alex Sekiris Skeptico. Today he makes his second visit to our forum, and this time equipped with his financial glasses. Now you may not like or agree with some of the facts and opinions he or for that sake I am expressing in this show. And that's quite all right, as the forum is not an opinion shaping or I should probably say forcing venture, but rather a thought provoking and educational platform to the benefit of your independent thinking, where if nothing else, we provide entertainment, actualizations, insight, paradigm transformation, and just interesting discussions. And indeed, today, this show is, as so many others, a discussion rather than a lecture from the guest. And hopefully it will contribute to your own understanding and raise awareness of important aspects of what's going on in our world. Welcome back to Forum Borealis, Robert. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this one. And... uh, yeah, I guess we could disclose that it was kind of uh, <laughs> lumped together at the last minute because of uh, the dramatic times we're in. And, and we'll try to get this out, uh, bypassing the queue of the never-ending shows. One of them is uh, uh, that has been lost in the bottleneck has been the last one we did with you. But as we're speaking now, we're uploading it to YouTube. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And now we're turning completely 180 degrees around because now we're going into, we're leaving traditionalism, we're leaving the spirit, we're going deep into matter. (laughs) And uh, today we're going to discuss the money game, the smokes and mirrors that is economy. And of course, you being um, into the spiritual stuff, uh, you're also into this stuff, and in, in a way, this is the material <laughs> version of magic. <laughs> it is. It is. I've yeah. often considered um, markets trading. This is a type of alchemy. Mm, exactly. I, I believe uh, Joseph Farrell, who you are familiar with. Yes. I believe he actually. Yeah, he has some books where he used that that title. The alchemy of uh, money. Sure. Okay, so, yeah, we'll touch some of the stuff that, at the end, we'll get into stuff that he's been writing about and Catherine Fitz. But I'll follow your suggestion to me before we started here, uh, beginning from the beginning. And that's clear-cut definition. So, basically, what is money, Robert? Yeah, I, I really think it's important when we begin these types of discussions to define the terms because if you think about money, it's the one thing we all want and it's the one narrative in the world that we all believe in. Everyone believes in the dollar narrative from the the, the craziest terrorist to the biggest capitalist. They all believe in that dollar. So what exactly is it? And I think it's important that we establish that. Um, how I like to define money, the classical definition. So if you go to a, an economics textbook, the number one definition usually has three definitions, but the most important is it's a store of value. So money is something that stores value. Yeah. I usually call it, um, symbolic energy. Does that Ex- work? Exactly. That, that works perfectly. Okay. And I have a couple of examples that I like to use because this is really fundamentally the most important part of the definition. The other two definitions are it's a means of exchange. So it's something we use to exchange, right? Mm-hmm. 
for barter. And then it has to be divisible in some way. But the store of value part is crucial. So if we look at the most common store of value in history, it's usually gold or silver. Those were two very popular stores of value. Mm -hmm. And so if what, what you have to do is think about that piece of gold. Let's just take a kilo of gold or an ounce of gold. An ounce of gold is worth $1,600, and $1,600 will buy you um, a really old car, okay? Okay. But what exactly is that ounce of gold? So, I mean, when you look at it, it's a, it's a precious metal. But why can this precious metal get you a car? Because most people, it, it, it how do we do that exchange? And in essence, what that gold is, it's storing the work it took to extract the gold. So it stores the work. And deep down what money is, money is simply work. Now I can give you an example. Imagine tomorrow I say, I'll sell you a kilo of gold for an excellent price. Bring me the cash, bring me the hundred grand and you'll get your gold. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I say, meet me beside some mountain. And we meet there. You bring the, I say, I ask you, do you have the cash? And you say, yes. And you say, where's the gold? And I point to the mountain. I say, yeah, there's a kilo of gold in that mountain. <laughs> Would you give me the cash? Absolutely no. not. Right. Mm. So what's the difference? And when I teach this, the difference. The work. Yes. The work to retrieve the gold. Yes. It's the work. It's not the gold itself. It's the work. And you can use this example with fish. You know, I mean, if I sell you a ton of uh, tuna and I say, meet me at the port and I just point to the ocean, <laughs> it's the same idea. What you're paying me for, what the fish stores is all of the work, the know-how, the culture, the skill, everything that goes into catching fish. That's what's stored in that fish. It's funny you use fish as example because when we had Professor Ball on discussing climate, he told me that you know the Hanseatic states, the the right, yeah, trading uh, colon uh, cities back in the day, they used herring as currency. You could you could salt pay, and herring, right? Yeah, you could pay your uh, your. I forgot the term when the Catholics give you uh, the indulgences, a stairway to heaven. The indulgences, or yeah, yeah, like uh, you can buy past the queue here. You pay us, and you'll get to heaven. So they used herring, and the Reformation came about when the herring uh, industry plummeted. But anyway, go on. Yeah, and and that's that's a perfect example. Salt is another wonderful store of value. Salt used to be money. Mm. Um. Do you know that? Have you ever heard that tradition? You know, there's a tradition. I don't, but in Europe, it's kind of common where you don't hand, when you hand the salt, you put it down and the other person picks it up. So if I say, pass me the salt, you put the salt down and the other person, you never give it to somebody hand to hand. Right, right. And do you know what the origin of that is? No. It, when salt was money, if I'm handing you the salt and it drops, who, who dropped it? Hmm. And so who, who lost the money, right? Right, right. <laughs> so what they the tradition was I put the salt down and then you picked it up. When I put it down and when, as soon as you pick it up, it's yours. They, they throw it over the shoulder too. That's an old, right, uh, an old tradition. But, but I'm thinking the fridge uh, revolution must have really killed that monetary <laughs> unit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, think about, think about prisons. In prisons, one of the, the traditional store of value in prisons was cigarettes. Mm. That was a traditional money. So um, that's what money really is. Now, something happened. Traditionally, gold, silver, salted fish, like we mentioned, these were all stores of value because they last a long time. The work I do to get that ounce of gold, that gold can last thousands of years. So it, it stores. Now, fresh fish is a good store of value for about, what, two days. Mm. Now, after three or four days, it doesn't store the value very well. And after a week, it's worthless. So that's what I mean, what a store of value, it stores the work permanently. And gold was excellent at that. Silver is another one, right? Right. So when we talk about money, what we're talking about is work. Now, it's very important. If you have a piece of gold, the work is already done. 
This is work that has been done. Mm. In modern economics, modern money is created through debt. Now, the difference is it's a promise of future work, not of work that's already done, of work that will be done in the future. Oh, that has so many weaknesses. I mean, that's insane. Uh, you know, the uh, I pitched you the cartoon uh, thing called Money as Debt. Mm -hmm. One and two, I recommend it to my listeners. That's about the extent of my insight into this, that and Sightgeist. But would you say uh, other people who are familiar with those productions, where they try to explain mm -hmm. this boring and complicated subject in a dumbed-down, intuitive uh, way, would you would you say it's sufficient? Um. Th there's, uh, you know what I would recommend? Go, if you go to YouTube and put in, uh, Professor Richard Werner, who's a, a German professor, mm -hmm. he did an interview on Russia Today. Just put Richard Werner RT into YouTube and it'll come up. He gives an absolutely brilliant explanation at a much higher level. Mm. On a much more sophisticated level. Because in Zietgeist, there were a couple things that y y you have to, I can just tell you a quick story. When I was, I wrote the first article I wrote about the, I've been writing about money since, I don't know, the late two, 2008, 2009, that period. But in around 2010, I really got to, I, I decided I need to define money. What is it? And it was, when I understood it, it was so simple that I couldn't write the article. I never, I will never forget this day. I spent three or four months And I said, I, it can't be this easy. And I never forget when my, my wife was writing her dissertation. And one day I said, I just got to do this. And I sat down and I wrote it. I published it. It was actually quite popular. It was probably the most popular article I've ever written, mm. um, The Moral Hazard of Modern Banking. It was published in many – it was on many, many blogs at the time. And, you know, I still had doubts because – The essence of this is so simple. How money – today's money is created is so simple that you think it can't be that easy. It's too simple, but it isn't. But but try to explain to us how debt mm -hmm. works as, yeah, sure. as a modern uh, – uh, So – Yeah. So we, we've, decided, we've defined what money is. It's a store of value, okay? Yeah. It stores value. Store value for work. F of work. It stores the work. Yeah. Now – In modern banking, what happens is, is when you go to a bank, what you do is you take a piece of paper and you say, I, Robert, will pay $100,000 in 10 years at 3%. Let's forget about the interest for right now, okay? Mm. So that's an IOU, right? Yeah. Now, if you go into a grocery store and you buy $20 of groceries – And you hand the, and I hand them an IU that says, I, Al, will pay Robert 20 bucks in two weeks. And I hand it to the, the girl at the cash register. Presumably it's your store, right? No, no. Imagine any store. I walk in and I say, Hey, is this good? Is Al? But wouldn't I tell them I owe you in the cashier? Not, not Robert, because you have nothing to do with the shop, right? Right. No, but think about it this way. Imagine you owe me 20 bucks. Yeah. And. I lend you 20 bucks and you sign a little piece of paper to say, I, Al, will pay 20 bucks in two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I go into a grocery store. Oh, right. You do it. Yeah. And I say, is this good enough? Because Al's going to pay me. <laughs> well, instead of paying me, he'll pay you. Yeah, you know right. what the girl at the grocery store will say? She'll say, you know, that, that, that's great. I'm sure Al's an honest guy, but can you just give me the cash? <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. So what banks do, what banks do is they take IOUs, right? Uh -huh. And they convert them into cash. They convert right. them into money that we all accept. Okay. So then they get double because they already get the stored value money because that still exists in circulation, right? But in addition, no, no, it no, doesn't. No. There is no, there is no money that is stored value. I mean, you can buy assets, you can buy precious metals, but when we talk about money, currencies, let's just keep it to the dollar, just to keep it simple. Yeah. But they all work on the same principle, the yeah. euro, the yen, all modern money works this way. But let's just stick to dollars because it is the reserve currency still and everything's still pegged to it. So there there really is no money that stores work that's already been done. The dollars, what every dollar bill is, is a promise, somebody's promise 
to do work in the future. Okay, pause there, because mm-hmm. what has happened to the value of the accumulated work that has already been done? Ah. If that's not in our mon- monetary system, where has that gone? Just, that that gets destroyed. So let me explain. So when okay. the bank when the bank takes that IOU, that promissory note, okay, mm-hmm. in technical terms, it's a security. What the bank's doing, right? Mm-hmm. It's buying a security from you. It's giving you a hundred thousand dollars, and it's saying, "Give me that security." As you pay that money back to the bank, the bank destroys the money. The money gets destroyed. There's a debit, which is your IOU, the positive side, Mm -hmm. and the negative side is the money. As you pay back that debt, the IOU gets smaller, right? 80, 50, hopefully down to zero. And when that IOU gets to zero, all the money you've paid back becomes zero and is wiped out. You see right. what I mean? Yes. So what we're doing is we're, we're, we've pushed the work to the future. Mm. So what banks do, remember, banks do not lend money. They don't lend money. All banks do are buy securities and then they sell securities. Now, this is another thing that most people don't understand about banks. When you go to the bank, let's say you have $100,000 and you deposit the $100,000 in the bank. Most people think that that's their money and the bank's holding it on to it for them, right? Yeah, like it was a bank box and you put 100,000 of gold in that box. Exactly. It's a deposit. Now, deposit, that's really not what the bank, what what you're doing is just the, it's the opposite operation. Mm. The bank is writing you the IOU and you're buying it from the bank. You see, the the bank is selling a security to you. Your checking account. Uh, security, you must define that term, uh, notwithstanding for international audience. Sure. A, a security is any is any piece of paper, okay, any piece of paper that has a value in currency. So, for example, a bond. So, so the dollar is actually a security. K- kind of. The but paper. Think of it. Think of it more of as as like um, a treasury bond, a bond. Mm, mm. You know, from a government bond, a 10-year uh, bond. Or, or a stock. A stock could be, a too. A stock yeah. is a security. Exactly, exactly. A stock, a piece of paper that says you own so many shares. It's just a piece of paper, the value. But that, that's, a, that's a dollar bill. A dollar bill is totally that today, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. What that dollar bill represents is some outstanding loan somewhere. Right. It's a loan that has not been paid back in full. Okay, I have to stop you again, and I'm going to do that many times because I have to follow you in this. Okay, okay. So what happens then when a lot of people either go bankrupt so they can't pay back to the bank or they just die, mm-hmm. so they are taken out of the equation? How can they balance that uh, negative? Yeah, okay, this is very important. And this is this is very important to understand, for example, the financial crisis that's going on now and yeah. the one that went on in 2008. Um, when, uh, when there are certain limits on how much a bank can lend, it's called the reserve requirement. So the federal reserve, the bank takes its capital, it's working capital. So let's say I'm a, let's just say I'm, ba- I'm banker, John, I open my bank. This is obviously very simplified. And now I have to put my capital into, uh, the central bank. Let's just call it a hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Now, that money sits in the central bank. It's $100. And the central bank says, okay, you can create 10 times your working capital, your reserves. That's the limit on the bank. So the bank can only make $1,000. It can only create $1,000, okay? Mm -hmm. In the case that that money is not paid, that that loan goes bad, right, Mm -hmm. the bank has to go out and get real money. It has to go out and get dollars, borrow them or increase its its working capital and replace that money in its reserves. That's the limit on the bank. So in the case, like you said, imagine someone takes a hundred thousand dollar loan. Let's say there's no insurance, right? Mm -hmm. Let's just make it real simple. They take a hundred thousand dollar loan. That means that the bank has about uh, $10,000 on reserve in the central bank for that 100000 Imagine that loan's not paid. It, nothing was ever paid on it. The guy signed it, killed over and died, and he had no insurance. 
the bank has to replace $90,000 in reserves. That's the limit on the banking system. That's what keeps uh-huh. it. So you can just add the amount of customers and the amount of values uh, the bank has, and then it's the same principle as if it was one person in your example. Exactly. Yeah. So what happens is in these financial crises, is leverage. So the banks, let's say they have a thousand dollars in reserve, they can make they can create ten thousand, but that leverage works the other way when people don't pay their loans. That's why they call it a run on liquidity. It just sucks the liquidity up. That's why if you look at the stock market today, look at the price of gold in the last month. It's collapsed because people are selling real assets like crazy, looking for liquidity to to stop all of this leverage that's just gone wild. You mean when you say they're selling real assets, you mean gold and silver, right? Gold, silver, and stocks. <laughs> anything- and stocks, stocks ain't uh, real assets. Sure, it is. They can be no. I mean, stocks are just that's magic too. That's just paper. They they can be worthless. Uh, if the stock market plunges like it actually has now, you, mm-hmm. you you're just having a piece of paper. But gold and um, real estate will never lose value because people will always need a place to live. Mm-hmm. And like you said yourself, noble metals will will be are everlasting, right? So those are the are the kind of real values. I, I don't see how you can call stock a real value. Well, imagine imagine you own twenty uh, percent of Tesla stock. <laughs> Tesla, yeah, sure. <laughs> no, no. For for example, yeah. that that has a real. I mean, Tesla has real assets. It has real, and it has products that they sell. And you get, you know, a Tesla, I don't think pays a dividend, but imagine a, 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 like an old, one of these old companies that actually pays a dividend every year. You know, you actually, you own something that's, it's a tangible asset in a sense. Um, but so when, when people, when there's, when there's a run on liquidity, when banks, when all of a sudden people can't pay loans, banks need cash. So they sell everything. Mm. And everything gets sold. And this is what you're seeing now. You're seeing everything get, getting sold everywhere and money going yeah, in. And, and I bet who, who's buying, the only people who can buy are those who always have milked these crisis situations, namely the old money, oligarchs, uh, and they're taking you know, everyone else out of the equation, even each other sometimes. It's like cannibalism in these uh, uh, crisis, but, uh, but Al, 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 this week there have been there have been moments when there was there were no bids. You could because wow. I, I follow the markets pretty closely, and the, nobody the only people who were actually buying were the central banks. Right, you could tell. You could just tell. I mean, there was there wasn't a bid. There was there were no bids because that old money was sitting back, going, scratching their chin, going, "Wow, in about two months, this is going to be all really cheap." <laughs> yeah, but they're not they're not stupid enough to try and catch the falling knife. No, they back up and they go, "Ooh, this is going to be real cheap soon." But they weren't buying. <laughs> right, <laughs> no, I, I get you, but it's funny. Uh, I think it was. Um, Oh, this British actor, Jeremy Irons, he said, I think this was during the last crisis, he said that uh, everybody owe, is owing money, you know, people, countries, everybody's in debt and it's just increasing. But who are they? He was playing the role of, you know, uh, the little boy who pointed to the to the emperor and said he had no clothes on. That's what Jeremy <laughs> Irons did. So he said, but who are we owing all this money to? Yeah. Uh, obviously, if we if someone is in debt, someone is collecting. Right. I don't th- think he actually said round them up and hang them, but it wasn't far from it. I mean, it should be able to be deleted. So, if we are in debt, is it to the mm-hmm. banks we're in debt? Absolutely, absolutely. We're in de- who who owns that debt are the banks. Now, remember, just but just just what remember, and, and this is important. It's very easy to say this is a scam. Um, that's, it's, it's just a racket, but it's not necessarily so. And this is, this will eventually get us to modern monetary theory. Mm-hmm. If a bank creates, imagine you want to build, you have a factory and you want to build, you know, a, you want to build a new factory and you go to the bank and you say, look, I am going to create a factory worth a million dollars. 
I want a loan from you. The bank studies it and they say, okay, we're going to create $1 million in exchange for your promise to pay it back in 10 years. Go build your factory. If you create, if you actually create something with that money, you see what I mean? You do that future work Mm -hmm. and that future work is a factory and the bank created the money to build that factory and you paid it back. It's, it's actually not a dishonest way of banking. Mm -hmm. It, It really isn't. And And I would recommend people read the stuff of uh, Professor Werner because, um, you know, he's a very well-respected academic. But he talks about – Sorry, go on. He talks about – Yeah, he talks about how in Germany a lot of – you know, and I've I've worked in banking. I think we talked about this, no? And I remember – I worked in European banking on the Spanish side, which Spanish banking is very different than German banking. Germans are very averse to taking loans. So, for example, your typical Spaniard had seven or eight banking products compared to the typical German who had two or three. Um, Germans don't like mortgages that much. They don't buy mortgages like the Spanish buy mortgages. And German banks invest a lot. They have a lot of small banks that invest in small and medium-sized businesses. And that's why you have this – it's one of the reasons why you have this amazing German economic model where you have lots of small businesses that export across the world. Because if you create that money and on the other side an asset is created, it's really, you know, you you can make an argument that it works, the system works. But where it doesn't work is if you create money just to buy more money, to buy more money with leverage. You right. see what I mean? Yeah. Then it becomes then it becomes a bubble. Then it becomes ridiculous. But <coughs> there's such a thing. <coughs> Maybe you can explain that. Two seconds. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Sorry, I, I, it's not Corona. I promise. <laughs> That's what they all. Say. I swallowed my own <laughs> spit. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, micro loans, mm-hmm. fractional banking. There are some terms I think you should clear up here. Well, I think if I understand correctly, and I, I don't know that world that well, but I was working with a company recently doing a little consulting for them. Peer to peer lending or micro loans, this is where people actually lend their own money. So imagine, Al, you have 10,000 euros. And you go to your bank and they say, ah, we'll pay you 1%. And then you go someplace else and there are people who will pay you. Well, well, hang on. What do you mean they pay me 1%? What do you mean? Well, imagine you went to your local bank with 10,000 euros. They'd probably give you what? 1%, 2%, something like that. You mean in, in interest if I put them in into interest. the account? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But but what, what you're doing is actually you're lending that $10,000 to the bank and they pay you 1%, no? Right. Uh, but if you – micro lending is a little different because it's peer-to-peer lending. It's like you lending me money. And bypassing the bank. Remember, banks do not lend money. They buy and sell securities. It's very important. No, they create money. They mm. cre- they're money creators and money destroyers. They would also destroy the money once the loan yeah. is paid. But if you and I – imagine I have a small business and you say, all right, I'll lend you 10,000 euros, but I want 4%. You see, see how it's different? You're actually giving me your capital and I'm paying you interest. It's a very different – it's a different type of a, of a loan. And that's what I think is going on when we talk about peer-to-peer lending and microloans. This is, this is actually people investing their money in businesses directly. It's not banks creating the money and then destroying it. Mm. This can get – now, one of the key elements – this is very important in, in – modern banking is the cyclical nature of it because as we boom as we have every areas of growth what banks do is they create a lot of money right Mm -hmm. and the economy grows but at some point at some point there's a downturn because there's just not enough new growth and people stop borrowing And then the money supply – and they start paying back their loans. And then the money supply begins to shrink. And as that money supply begins to shrink, 
people get a little bit nervous about the future and stop investing, stop borrowing. Yeah, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, an evil circle. Exactly. Yeah. And then it collapses. And this goes a lot into I'm sure you've talked about, you know, do you know the Strauss Howe theory, the generational theory, the fourth turning? Yeah, Just, I'm not very Yeah, I've heard about it, but you can explain. Yeah, it's it's a generational type theory. I won't go too much into it, but it it basically says a generation is 20 years. Yeah. And a cycle is four generations. Right. So, if you look at for example, the current cycle, the current cycle, the last crisis we had before this one was the Great Depression in the 1930s. Mm. It's almost eerie if you look at it. The, the 1929 was the crash, right? Mm. 80 years later, four generations later, right, you have the 2009 crash. And think about each of those four parts as spring, summer, fall, winter. Right. But, but wasn't there at least a recession in the late 80s? Oh, yeah. But that was more of a um, – how can I put it? That was kind of the end of a cycle in the beginning of a really big debt cycle. Mm. And then you get – once you get to winter, there's always some sort of a moment that marks the beginning of the winter. And, of course, the beginning of the winter was um, the uh, 9-11, 2001. Yes, right. And then you get to the financial crisis in 2008, which was really the beginning of that of that dark crisis period. And the coronavirus is the equivalent to the second war. When we get through this coronavirus, we'll be in the new spring. It'll be like 1946 yeah. again. Yeah, but we don't have an FDR to save the system uh, as he did back then with the New Deal and all that stuff. And he held them accountable. Obama did the opposite. After all, uh, he was hated and he welcomed their hate. Uh, Obama, instead of bailing out people, he bailed out the culprits. And, he bailed out the banks. Yeah, yeah and, and the corporations. Yeah. But isn't it interesting that Donald Trump is writing checks? He's t he's giving everyone $1,000 a month. <laughs> I love it. And Obama kicked out 5 million people from their houses. Yeah, you know, you see. and and uh, but obviously he can't kick people. I mean, he has to stop the kicking out of houses because uh, that's certainly a way to spread the disease. But it's so interesting because I saw first, mm -hmm. obviously Yang brought it to the general debate, right? Yes, the UBI, and and, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I appreciate that. Although he sold totally sold out after that, but Tulsi took it and run with it. Yeah. And she has been trying to pressure the Trump administration all the time on many areas. And they have to listen. Is there anything you, you have to give him? It is he, his political instincts. Uh, with that, I mean, he has a way to understand the masses. That's why he was a reality show star, too. Right? Oh, yeah. So he knows his audience and he knows that Tulsi has uh, an influence there. And even Mitt Romney. That uh, CIA stooge started to talk about, yeah, we have to bail people out because they have no other option. They have no, they, have, they don't know what to do. They're children, right? And the great thing with having a guy like Trump in charge rather than a Wall Street slave like, say, Biden mm -hmm. is because if it was Biden, we would be screwed if he was president right now because he would just do what his, his owners would tell him. But Trump has stumbled into this thing. We have some Trump listeners and they hate it when I speak negative of him. But hey, I'm also giving kudos when it's due. And I'm giving it now kind of because mm -hmm. he's not married to, in a way, he's he's tied himself to the most of, uh, well, he tried flirting with the neocons. He wanted to play different sides to each other, right? Religious uh, nuts in the Republican. But the Republican establishment, he, he kind of conquered and tamed them, but he doesn't have any ideas really, especially not when he booted out his ideologist like, um, uh, what's Bannon, his name? Steve Bannon. Yeah, people like that, right? So, so, and that's great because he doesn't have like an ideological um, a limit. So he would try and do what he as a businessman thinks is the best thing, especially for being reelected. So he he's a populist still. He's a populist in his veins. You can say he's a fake populist, but he does 
to a much greater degree than Obama or Biden or Clinton would have done, listen to the pressure oh, of the abs- people. Oh, absolutely. But the thing is, he has no choice. I mean, we have to be clear about this. You could have Mickey Mouse could be our president and they would be doing this. It's you know what I mean? This is not this is not something that well, this no, is not, no, Joe Biden. No, no. Al, there's no there are no. This is the last bullet in the gun. Let me give you an example. What they did. If you take the first the first wave of this bubble was the dot com bubble. Yeah, the dot com yeah, bubble. That's right. So in the dot com bubble, they had three bullets in the gun. They had the, the simple one was just slam the interest rates to zero, bring down the interest rates all the way. And they did it and it worked. Yeah. So what happened? All that money was out there chasing, um, chasing high returns. And what did they look for? They looked for mortgages, ah, yeah. mortgages, subprime mortgages, people paying seven, eight percent on their on their mortgages. We package these things. We lever them up a thousand to one, a hundred to one, whatever they levered them up to. And they made a fortune that bubble burst. And then there was two bullets in the gun. And so what they did is they used the second bullet. That was quantitative easing. Now, quantitative easing, all that means is the Federal Reserve prints money and goes out and buys assets. So they bought, um, in the United States, they bought mortgage-backed securities and bonds, and they flooded the zone with money. And what happened? The economy kind of kind of got back on its feet. The stock market soared because all the money they printed went into the stock market. The greatest stock market in history from March 2009 till three weeks ago. <laughs> it was the greatest stock market in history. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, but hang on, hang on. This, the stock market is not mm-hmm. a real measure of the economy. It's the real measure of the elites. What they always ignore is John Doe, right? The man in the street. And the stocks can do great and the people can be slaves. What we've seen is the eradication of the middle class since the, oh, yeah. since the, right? So we have to take that into account. Oh, they've created so many jobs. Well, these are low, uh, income jobs. Most Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. And no, that's true, Al, but Al, the people were living. They were getting by. It, you know what I mean? The economy got back on its feet. I mean, I, re- I was living in New York in 2008. Right. That was some scary shit, dude. I mean, yeah. it looked like I, mean, I just I remember sitting in bars and just watching people shake. It was scary. And it triggered a renaissance for the old dichotomy between Hayek and um, Keynes. Before we go on into modern mm-hmm. times, could you give us just like a, a dumbed down fast food version of, of that uh, dichotomy. Sure. Because the, 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 that, that's kind of essential. It brought about people like Ron Paul, you know. And that would, yeah, that would be Hayek in the Austrian school. So let's look yeah. at Keen, the, the Keynesians first. So the dominating school, yeah. Yeah. So in, in the 1920s, in the 1920s, obviously there was a major boom. And then we had that, we had the depression in 1929, the, um, Stock market collapses and Keynesian the Keynesian idea is that the government in times of depression and recession, what the government has to do is spend. Don't worry about deficits. Spend, 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 and you will kind of relubricate the wheels of the economy. You dump enough money into the economy and the wheels start turning again. That was the Keynesian model. And it was based on a very loosey goosey kind of monetary uh, idea about money. No, money was something that you could create. You could have deficits. And the, and 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 this to be to be completely clear about this, Keynes said that in times in the boom times, government shouldn't deficit spend. They should save money, and then spend that excess money in the recessions. That's the Keynesian model, the dovish model. On the other extreme, you had the Austrian school. The Austrian school is basically the gold standard. No, mm-hmm. we should money. You can't create money. So, so they they are kind of more in support of let money be stored and past work. Exactly, exactly. And and Keynes are embracing the future. Embracing the future, spend, 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 mm. get the wheels turning. But the, the fascinating thing is, um, you know, 
in foxholes, you know how I was saying, you know, in their foxholes, there's no atheists in deep, massive crises like today, because this is a lot of I, you know, I, I don't I can't tell you 100 percent. I'm sure that this is the worst we're ever going to see. But this smells this walks and smells like something really bad. In these foxholes, there are no libertarians, Al. There are no kid, there are no Austrian school guys saying, yes, 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 no deficit spending, let them all die. No, 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 no. They're, they're disappeared. Go, I, I, I would yeah. I'd pay you a million dollars. You find me a politician now, libertarian, who's saying, no, 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 no deficit spending, let them all die. Because if we let them all die, <laughs> there's uh, going to be nothing left. <laughs> let, let us do a little detour there. Because both of us have, uh, coming from a very sympathetic mm-hmm. approach to libertarianism, but like I told you the other day, uh, my view has matured into... I mean, both of us realize, of course, that in real politics, it's irrelevant because there's no such thing as a free market, right? Just exactly. like there's no such thing as socialism in the world. Or there's no it such was, thing. Yeah. I mean, in the pure original definition of the words. But just disregarding that, you, you know, the utopian example, even in practical example, I think that free market is perfect when it comes to Precisely a market, you know, commodities, yeah. trade, selling, buying of, of merchandise. Then I'm all for a libertarian model. Don't intervene with the woman selling her fish on the town square, okay? Exactly. Let them exactly. go about with their business. Then you can, of course, talk about libertarianism and, you know, identity politics, social stuff. But we are sticking to economics now. Mm-hmm. But the problem is when these fundamentalists blow up the definition and makes everything a commodity. Enter, for example, the healthcare debate. Those people who think that healthcare should be a business, they should be consistent then and say that, okay, yeah. let's privatize police, let's privatize military, let's privatize, pri- well, you actually do privatize prisons, and that's crazy. <laughs> that's creating crime, actually. Uh, uh, let's privatize fire department. And America actually did that. Of course, America did. <laughs> Who else? I think it was like a yeah. uh, hundred years ago or something. And of course, what happened was that shit. Uh, my neighbor can't afford hiring a private uh, fire uh, squad. So his fire is spreading over to me. And that's kind of what we're seeing now. Oh, in yeah, the corona yeah. crisis. I mean, imagine if this was 50% lethality. Suddenly people realize, oh shit, we're all in the same boat. We were actually a tribe. And what did they do in tribes? Of course you had to earn your living and, and contribute uh, out of what your resources were, what your talents were. But they wouldn't just throw you to the wolves if you got sick or hurt because that's a, a low investment in your own collective value. So it's the same here. We realize now that shit, the, those poor people with the, the hobos and stuff, mm-hmm. <laughs> they actually represent a threat for my health. And that's why I think so many, when the poll phrases it neutrally, about 75% of Americans say they want universal health care, free at point of service. You know, like everyone in the world has, except America and a few African states. If they ask them in the polls, manipulated and skewed like they usually do, because the media establishment obviously is the tentacles of the economic establishment, the oligarchs, then... 55% say they, they want it. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, and, and Al, you gotta remember, you gotta remember one thing, and I'll never forget this. When, when Hillary Clinton was vice president, remember she, she was the one who was pushing for a, a basically a, a universal healthcare system. Vice president? She never was vice president. I mean, vice, I'm sorry, first lady. I'm sorry. First right, lady. right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you might as well call her a vice president. Slip on the tongue. Yeah. She might have been. Yeah, yeah. I, I never forget when, when that bill was being, um, uh, proposed sitting next to her was the CEO of General Motors, and on the other side they had the CEO. I don't know, it was from General Electric or something. The American multinational corporations were dying for universal health care because they were flipping the bill. Hmm. All those UAW workers, they had to give them health benefits, so it was all on them. Hmm. They wanted to spread it out among all the among everybody. So you know, to have having a healthcare system like that where you spread the the cost 
and the risk across the entire country, it's better for actually for big business. It really is. Yeah. It makes them more competitive. If you look at look at the the American automotive industry in the 1970s and 80s compared to, say, the German automotive industry, the Germans kicked our asses because uh, one of the main one of the reasons was they didn't have to pay. They didn't have to pay disproportionately for the health care of their workers. Mm. So it's something that's good for everyone. But not, not to go down that rabbit hole because that's a whole different rabbit hole. But what I mean is that right now, today, what's the day? This is March 20th, isn't it? Um, we are in the middle of a massive crisis and in a crisis like this, that libertarian stuff just doesn't work. It doesn't work. And, and, and now it's not hobos and bums. It's you go to New York. Now all those bartenders and, uh, waiters and small business guys, guy, guys owns a bar, you know, those guys make good money. I mean, they're, they're not, you know, I mean, this is like, these are, you know, normal working people who buy stuff and make the whole economy go. Those people are all in the street. They don't have jobs. Mm. There is no money next, and there's no money in the bank. And what are they going to do next week? So, I mean, and this is happening across the country and across the world. So what I mean is what's happening now is, okay, there is not enough money. There is just not enough money to pay for what people- Hang on. When you say it's not enough money, I mean they are mm-hmm. printing money left and right like crazy. Obviously, there's enough, uh, but that's what. But I'm, there's not yeah. enough value. No. For example, if we if we just said, okay, the only way you can create money is when a bank creates a loan. What bank is going to loan a bartender who just got unemployed for what six eight months? Yeah. Are they going to give him a loan? No. So what happens? the The entire economy comes to a screeching halt. And people will starve to death, and everyone basically everyone will lose everything. There will be riots on the streets. Exactly. Unfortunately, they can't riot right now because of the corona. But that's that's why the politicians are pressured to do. I mean, Andrew Yang said that UBI will become inevitable when the automation has accelerated enough. He couldn't see that this thing that came now has kind of speeded up that process like times thousand, right? <laughs> imagine if, it's the I, same I, I mean, thing. I have to say it. Imagine if Andrew Yang had won the nomination and he was the Democratic nominee for the president today. He would win the election. Yeah, well, don't underestimate people's ignorance. In the Democratic primaries, by the way, they were rigged. I mean, downright cheat. Bernie had a total majority, just so you know, people, and we're going to have a show about it. But anyway, never mind that. Thing is, so we get thing is, Mm -hmm. the people were voting for Biden, not because they supported his views, but because they were brainwashed by the mainstream media to think that he is the electable one. So people don't always vote for issues and content. They vote for all these distractions that the media is there to create, right? So I wouldn't be so sure. And Bernie Sanders, I like Bernie Sanders a lot. He's a very um, intelligent, informed. I I really like Bernie Sanders. But Bernie Sanders lacks balls, yeah, if you just, want to be president, yeah. he, you got. I'm sorry, I know it's a vulgar term, but you got to have a solid pair. I know. And when someone messes with you, you have to put you have to put everything on the line. You say, "I'm going to burn down this party." Yeah. You know, I've had family in the Democratic Party since the 1890s. So I mean, wow. I, I I never forget when we had elections. My grandmother would always say, "Real Irish Catholic Democrat, uh-huh. Tammany Hall or no hall at all." It was a common phrase in New York. And you know what that meant? That meant we, the Irish Catholics, have a racket, which is the Democratic Party in New York. It's our little mafia. And if you try and get rid of it, we are going to burn the entire city down. And people knew that the Irish were capable of burning the whole city down. They're crazy. So they said, okay, okay, okay. You can have your little racket there. Just let us have our big racket. Okay, okay. Mm. That's politics. Yep. When you play that kind of politics, you got to have balls of iron. And you, ha- Bernie had to look at them and say, I am going to go out and I am going to burn down the Democratic Party and it will never, it will never rise again or you make me the nominee. Choo. Yeah, uh, Tulsi has the biggest balls on that side of the American politics. She, yeah. uh, she will do, and you know, Trump had those balls. He took on 
the Trump has balls. He has balls, and he took on the Republican establishment. And Trump, they, Trump took over the Republican Party. He, yeah. he he whipped them into a submission, and it was a beauty to watch uh, all these despicable uh, elites. But Bernie, he went into the same exact trap as Ron Paul did a cycle or two before him. Uh, they kind of remind me of each other. They are honest and principled to a fault. They're like autists, both of them. But they're yeah. also extremely nice people. Yeah. They are so gentle and polite, and they're a whole different um, generation. So you're completely right. Both Bernie and Ron Paul, they were both screwed by their own parties. They were cheated. Oh, absolutely. Uh, millions of votes. And I think after Ron Paul, uh, the populism movement went to Donald Trump. I think the same will happen here. I think Tulsi is clever to stay in the election mm -hmm. because she's getting name recognition. I think she will be the new, she will be like, kind of like what Donald Trump was because the Republicans are like 10 years ahead of the Democrats here, right? They started with Paul in, was it 08 and 12? And then Trump came, so Bernie in 16 and 20. So I'm expecting Tulsi to, to clean table in, in 20. But now things are going so fast, so who knows? But I think what's going to happen, going back to the, the, the cycle theory, this is the winter. This is the darkest. Think of this, the equivalent. If you go, if you go to cycle theory, this is 1939, 1940. We're going into yeah. that, that. And if that cycle theory, I mean, remember the cycle before the Second World War, if you go back 80 years, what do you get? You get the Civil War, mm. the U.S. Civil War. I mean, the cycle theory really does work. Yeah. And I think what we're going into is a tunnel. Donald Trump will drive us in, but I don't think he'll drive us out. I don't think he will be. We will get true leadership, I think, on the other side. I think somebody will, I think somebody will step up because the Democratic Party, if you, I mean, look, I, I've been, a, I've always been Democrat, um, until I just couldn't do it anymore. It just made me sick. Yeah. And then I became a libertarian and then I realized that's also kind of a dogma thing. And now I don't know what the hell I am. And I think there's, there's a lot of people like me out there. Embrace it. That's healthy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Embrace like I, I really I, I've kind of now I'm a little weary of any kind of dogmatic. Um, I learned a lot. You know where I became a libertarian was living in Russia. I lived in Russia, mm. and I said, good God, government. But then, you know, I lived in China, and I saw, well, you know, yeah. <laughs> they did get a lot of people, you know. <laughs> but, you know, there's a movement now mm -hmm. for people, and we're not going to spend too much. We're going to get back on track, but I have to say this. It's so important, mm -hmm. and I'm going to try to get someone on for this. But there's a movement now to fuse the populist left and the populist right. If they manage that, the elite is without chance because – the establishment uh, in both the Democrats and the Republicans, they know very well that they are one party. The only difference between them is that they agree about economical stuff, war and all that stuff, banksters and, and screw the little man. Mm -hmm. They agree about all that, you know, working for the corporations and the banks. But then they have the identity politics where they are different. And, and, and they don't care. They don't care about that as much because they know what really matters is the economy. So they play with, so you have the neolibs and the neocons and on the left side of the establishment. Yeah. Yeah. We, abortion. Yeah. That's okay. For example. Right. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, no, no, but they don't really care. They know they're in, in the same party and their job is to facilitate that the powers that be the status quo is going on now the right populists and the left populists have a potential to ally on the essential things that they do agree about which is the important things just the same things that the establishment agrees about every time they vote together it's usually bad stuff for us right sure <laughs> if the populist could do the same there would be, but we are distracted by the identity politics. So the identity politic people on the right, no, no, we can't ally with the left because, uh, for example, let's say racial issues or cultural things. Oh, I can't be in a party with a Muslim or a Jew, for example, right? That's identity yeah. politics on the right or in the left or feminism or all these things that people are, are fighting about. So 
these things are just cultural add-ons and they are completely in a life and death situation as we are in now kind of sure although it could be much worse of course then people realize how little it really means. So the hope now is that when the Bernie faction is totally screwed over, they won't back Biden. So the only way Trump will lose this thing is if he screws up this crisis we're in. Okay. If he managed to somehow hang on to it, I think he will He will actually win. But we'll see. But- yeah, I mean, there is no way that Donald Trump will lose this election in November. <clears throat> I mean... Al, you want to win an election and you, you're going to put a thousand bucks in everyone's. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you can't, you can't lose. Yeah. Totally. But, but I think that's kind of forced the hand. Exactly. I mean, Trump is now doing socialism and he's now implementing measures to the left of the Democrats. Of course, not to the left of Bernie, but to the left of the established Biden and those people, neolibs. But there's, but it's an important, it's an important distinction that we should make is, Socialism is r- really when the state owns the means of production. Yeah, strictly. In speaking. this case, there is not there is nothing at, about that at all. It's simply it, this is pure monetary policy. It's printing money and giving it to people. Yep, yep. So it's a little bit different. You know? mm, I agree. Strict original definitions. Yeah, yeah. But I thought you said that you were talking long term, and you said that he wouldn't ride out on the other side. Oh yeah, I think. Because one thing we have to remember, uh, the Democratic Party was a party based on class. So it was it was especially if you look at the north, not take out the south, because the south gets more complicated between Democrats and Republicans. But if we look at, say, in the northeast, the Democratic Party was the, the party of the working class people. And the Republican Party was the, the party of the professional class, the capitalist class. But it wasn't always like this because under Ted Roosevelt, he was actually the the progressive when he was a Republican. I mean, the first Roosevelt. You mean, you mean Teddy? Teddy, yeah. Back then, uh, yeah. uh, the Republicans were actually progressives or part of them. Right, but on a – how can I how can I say it? Like on a, on a social level, on a – they were – could. Sort of that traditional conservatism became the Republican Party. Yeah, I mean, let's just let's bring it. Let's move the clock up a little bit. Say, yeah, yeah, from the Depression on. Okay. And so what happened in what happened in the Depression was the Republicans, the Conservative Party, at that time was definitely the Conservative Party. The Democratic Party was associated with the working class, and it actually wasn't a bad balance because you need that balance. It's it, every you oh you need that that side the conservative side the money side and sort of the working class side and if they come to a reasonable agreement on things then you have a society that works what happened was in in the socialist left you were, i don't know if you're old enough to remember this but in the 70s the 60s and 70s identity was associated with class it right. was a class association yes so your class identity marked you. And yeah. if you were, say, the capitalist class, the bourgeois class, you were definitely associated with – now, in Europe, it was different. But in the United States, you could kind of see it a little bit, no? No, no. It was stronger in Europe, I think, than in America. Of course. No, yeah. of course. Much stronger in Europe. But still, it, it, you had that that sense of the, the work I – rem- I mean, in my family, I, I mean, being – becoming a – like, I mean, if you take a typical Irish Catholic working class family – it was probably worse. Becoming a Republican would be like becoming a Protestant. You know what I mean? It was that bad. Yeah. So what happened was that changed because once once the Soviet Union collapsed and people realized that communism didn't work, there was a shift from that class struggle to the power struggle, the postmodern power struggle, yeah. the deconstructivist struggle, and that uh, identity politics, identity politics, and. I, I firmly believe this. Identity politics is incredibly toxic because what it does is it divides the it divides exactly. the left. It's a huge distraction. Well, it's, no, but it's not a distraction. It's cancer. Yeah. It's absolute cancer. And and it's a gift from the gods. It's divide and conquer. And what Steve Bannon, the genius of Steve Bannon, was he saw this happening and he said, yes. Look at all of these I mean, remember, the American electorate is 70 percent white, non-Hispanic white. 
And <laughs> so you take uh, and also skewed old, right and old. No, but I mean, as as much as they you watch television and you think that all white people are old, fat, and stupid, <laughs> the vast majority of working class Americans working are white. So this is the Democratic Party base, mm. and this identity politics. Whoever thought of this destroyed the Democratic Party because instead of it, imagine. Instead of uniting the Democratic Party, the working class people against this one percent and all, no, no, they divide among themselves. Mm. They will never, they will never restore because the hatred of one group against another, and you hate me because I'm this race or that uh, sexual. This who cares? What we want are jobs, benefits, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, that Ron Paul he introduced a good antidote to that. He said it's not groupism, individual rights. That's it. Mm. It doesn't matter who you are, what you are, whatever you are. You have uh, rights as individual, and that's true. And then you can also talk about a class perspective in addition, because you don't need, let's say, feminism. Or identify with your uh, religion or your culture or your ethnicity, because if you get class liberation, you get liberation on all those areas. It's always the tyranny of the powers that be mm -hmm. that creates these oppressional mechanisms, whatever they are, like racism or sexism or whatever. Those things are directly tied to economy and to the system we're living in. It's not coming from you know a vacuum where someone concocted up the idea of let's oppress everyone who is like this or that. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is oppression of it. Yes, people can grow up and accept it or e even embrace it. But the root causes of this is uh, tied to the what the old school paradigm would call class. But we today could say like the 99 percenters, right, versus the... Sure. Or, or maybe now it's not even the one percent; it's the zero point one percent. But but you know it's actually a lot simpler because politics is simple. You look at my electorate. Who's my electorate? How do I get them to vote for me? And you don't get your you don't get the biggest chunk of your electorate not to vote for you by calling them, you know, the old, old white men. And there these guys are like, hey, I'm an old white guy. Why why are you insulting me? You know. Yeah, but but that's presuming that those people want to unite. Well, maybe Bernie wants, but all, all these establishment tools, they want this divide and conquer. They need it. They but rely the on it. But the Democratic Party wants power. No, I mean, no, if you're, no, no, if you're no, a political no, no, party, no. you want power. You don't want to give the power away. No. No, their job, their job is the same as the Republican. It is to serve the corporate masters and to keep anyone in their own party who may threaten that away. That's why they were panicking for Trump, because they thought he was going to implement many of the... Th Remember, he, he ran on very radical uh, notions, not just anti-war, but although he even said universal health care. Mm -hmm. You know, Camp and Trump was very different from uh, the Trump that's been these four years. The crisis Trump, I think, will be much closer to Camp and Trump. So, so the function, the primary function of the one party system you have, which is divided into RNC and DNC, is to serve the corporate masters mm -hmm. and to keep away populism who may threaten that. Now, if you go back enough back in time, yes, I agree. There was a time, especially before money and politics, before bribes became a part of the system, then you could say, yeah, we should try to get as many votes as possible. But, yeah. you know, the democratic machine, they don't care if it's good for them to lose to Trump. Why? Because they can whip up this fake outrage, this fake, what do they call it, resistance or whatever they call it. Because money is flowing in, they are still, uh, you know, they, they earn on this annoyance with Trump. Mm -hmm. They get paid, all the consultants, the whole political class is going around. They get all the media gigs, they get the corporate bribes. But if a guy like Bernie, or for that sake, Ron Paul would have won, it's an existential threat to them because they're out of a job. Sure. And... Uh, they're out of bribes. So they may implement money out of politics, all this stuff. They, that won't work. So they are terror. No, they'd rather have someone. Of course, they don't want Trump. They want their own guy or the other, the Republican guy who represents the establishment. 
one of them is the ideal because then it will be business as usual. They have lucrative jobs. But I, th- I think you give them too much credit. I really do. Because <laughs> really? I, honestly, because it, let me just give you the traditional view in the United States was all the corporate people would be Republicans. And the working class people would be, the old you know, and I actually have I've had connections to certain, you know, on a certain level to the old school Democratic Party. And it was it was a corrupt machine, hmm. but it kind of worked. But what happened was those corporate guys who were always Republicans all of a sudden started becoming Democrats. Yeah. And the Democratic Party um what the Democratic Party did, there's a wonderful book called, um, what was that book about? Hey, Lefty. Uh, oh, I can't remember the name yeah, of it. Yeah, li- Listen, listen, listen lefty. Liberal. Listen, li- listen, Lefty or Listen, Liberal. Yeah. If you see that book, that book is absolutely, you read that book because that explains the whole thing. Yeah. They, the Democratic Party forgot that it's a working class party. They didn't forget. <laughs> you know who understood it? Bill Clinton. Clinton understood this. Now, Bill Clinton, I'm not saying Bill Clinton did a damn thing for the working man. He no. screwed him like, you know, but he, as a politician, he understood how to go out and get their votes. Yeah. He knew how to go out and say, come vote for me. And then, of course, he made his millions and gazillions. Reagan did he was a same. true. He was a real he was a real Democrat. And that's how the Democratic Party used to work. Now, I'll give you one example. A- AOC, no. Amazon says they're going to build – spend a billion dollars in Queens to build some uh, some headquarters. Now, the typical Democratic Party would say, yes, come. And then once they get in there, imagine the bribes and the scams. The mafia would make money. Mm. The, the unions would – everyone was going to make money. That's how the Democratic – that's how the Democratic Party worked. I'm not saying it was good or it was bad, but that's how it worked. AOC says we don't want that. I mean, my grandmother was spinning in her grave. Are you kidding? Think of all the money that <laughs> and, it, and all that would that money would trickle no, down. The, the Amazon <laughs> doesn't even pay taxes. No, no, she's right on that. Uh, it was a good thing to get rid Al, of. Them. Who cares? Al, but well, let's get to that. But let me get mm. to that because who cares about taxes? Because taxes means nothing to the working man. What means to the working man is Amazon goes in there and they say we're going to build this plant. And we're going to pay union electricians, union truck driver, union this, really? union that. Amazon oh, yeah. pay union, but they don't even pay uh, decent. In, in New York, in, in no, I mean to build the thing in New York oh, City. Okay. The New York City is old school corrupt. It gets yeah. its tentacles into you. They would have eaten him alive. Eaten him. Trust me, the mafia would have had made a <laughs> fortune. Everyone would have gotten a piece of uh, Jeff Bezos in New York. And AOC comes in and says, "We don't want." It's yeah. like a rich guy walking into a poker game, and the guy doesn't know how to play poker. They were gonna just eat him alive in New York. Trust but, me. But I, I disagree about Clinton. He was never. I mean, he he was a con man for. He he was kind of like Reagan. Yes, he was a good. Uh, he was kind of a populist. Populist of the eighties, of the nineties, right, right. but. Uh, just in rhetorics, he was ambitious and wanted to serve the corporate elite. And I think whatever ideals the Clintons had, it was definitely crushed when uh, when her health push was crushed. You mentioned that. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And after that, she became embittered and just completely sold out. But, you know, actually, you have to go back to the late 70s. That's when the real I mean, you could go back to JFK. Or you could go even further back. But the real trouble with money and politics started in the late 70s. And it was just sealed under Citizens United. And mm. now they all work for this. It's it's the banksters and the corporate dominance in, in, in both parties. But that's my view anyway. Let's let's uh, return a little more. I mean, it's so fun to discuss <laughs> the political aspect. But we're not done with the monetary no, aspect. No, no. And, and we got we have to bring – yeah, we got to bring this back to MMT. So we, yeah. we, we talked about what money is mm. and how it works. Now, one of the key insights of modern monetary theory is the following. And this began in the late 90s. There's um, an economist, um, what's her name? Uh, Stephanie Kelton, who was Bernie Sanders, actually, chief economic advisor. She wrote a paper in in the late 90s. What this insight is, is the following. We, and this is very important, when we think of a government, paying its bills, 
paying its invoices, right? Mm -hmm. we, what, we th what we think of is, okay, what does the government do? The government collects taxes, right? Mm -hmm. And then it takes those taxes and it adds up how much it has. And then if it's missing something, they sell bonds, right? You know, they issue bonds. Yeah. We all know what a bond is. Okay. So we issue bonds. You take well, the no, bonds. Well, not necessarily. You can explain that. Sure, sure. A bond is just a piece of paper that says uh, the United States government will pay a million dollars at 2% for 10 years. It's, it's just a piece of paper, it's right? It's an IOU. <laughs> it's an IOU. Exactly. It's exactly, exactly what it is. It's an IOU, and they, they sell it through a primary dealer in New York, and it's issued, and then they collect that money. So they take that money plus the tax money, and then they pay their bills, okay? Mm. That was the traditional idea of how, um, of how governments worked financially, okay? Mm. Now, one thing, I just want to get back to the, the explanation I gave for money. There are many, many textbooks that don't give that description of money, and they're all wrong. And don't believe me, the Bank of England, thank God, when I saw this, it made, <laughs> I, I breathed deeply, Al. Mm. The Bank of England came out with a video explaining that that's how money is created, how I explained it before. Right. But now we get to part two, which is how do, how do governments function? So that was a traditional idea. You take the tax money. If you're missing some, you sell some bonds. You take that chunk of money, and you go out and pay your bills. You pay your government workers. You buy your tanks. You do what a government has to do, right? Mm -hmm. But what the modern monetary theory did was investigate that. And they said, do governments actually pay for things from taxes? And they don't. And this is fascinating. Yeah. Because, because every time they, people want to implement something that benefits the people, you know what the mantra you, you hear then is, right? Mm -hmm. How are you we going? Yeah. Yeah. How are you going to pay for it? Exactly. I hate that mantra because it's now, a bullshit now. mantra. They never say that for the wars. They never say that for the tax uh, exempt of the elite. Uh, for the first time now, the billionaires are paying less taxes than the populace. So, so uh, it's so wonderful what you're going to talk about now because it will kill that myth. And nobody now is asking Trump, hey, UBI to all the citizens, how are you going to pay for it? <laughs> and never, never let a politician again. If if you listen, if anyone is listening to this, and I hope somebody will listen to this. If a politician, never let a politician say, where is the money? We don't have the money. Mm -hmm. Because now what I, what I just explained, that idea that governments take tax money plus whatever bonds they sell, right? Mm -hmm. And they buy their stuff. This, this is not how governments pay invoices. What governments do now, this is very important. And in, in modern monetary theory, this is called high-powered money, HPM, high-powered money, very important concept. What they do is at the treasury, they create the money. So imagine, let's just say 100 tanks. The government has to buy 100 tanks, and it's $10 million. They say, okay, treasury, pay General Dynamics or whoever it is who's, who builds these tanks. So what the treasury does, the treasury – well, actually, the, the, it's not the Treasury. It's their account at the central bank, okay? In this case, the Federal Reserve. Yeah. They create an account. They create the $10 million, the cash they're going to pay for the tanks. And on the other side, that's the debit. I mean, that's the credit. And on the debit, there is this number that needs to be washed out, right, mm -hmm. with the taxes that will come. So the money's created, the tanks are paid for. Then they say, okay, we created $10 million. Now we have to go out and get $10 million in taxes. And if we can't get $10 million in taxes, we're going to have to sell a couple bonds. Okay. Wow. So even that is future direct. Yes, absolutely. And it's very important. So, so in a way, they're enslaving the entire coming generations. This is the and think of it like a baseball or a baseball game for Europeans, a football game. Yeah. When you guys go to a football game, you bring a ticket, right? Mm -hmm. And you give the ticket to the guy at the, at the booth. He cuts the ticket in half and you go in and you watch your football game. Mm -hmm. But somebody had to create that ticket first, right? Right. It's the same with the money. The government must create the money first, spend it, then collect it in taxes. 
So the, the government itself, and this is called high-powered money, creates this money and it spends it, okay? Mm-hmm. For monetary policy reasons. Now imagine a government that spent money like crazy. They just spent money, spent money, spent money, and there was no taxes. Eventually, you would get inflation. Right. Eventually. Right. But, but that inflation comes when you've used all of your resources all of the resources in the economy. So let's let's use you a simple example. Imagine there are a thousand, or there's a hundred orange trees. Okay, let's say, and there's a thousand oranges. If some of those oranges aren't getting picked, the government can create money, pay some guy to go pick those oranges, and as long as they don't pay him too much, and as long as they don't spend too much on those oranges, there is no inflation because those are resources we're not using. But if the government goes and tries to buy something that's already been bought, then you get inflation. Do you see what I mean? I um, think I understand. I'm not. But look, could you indulge me and let's use Monopoly as an example? Now, let's say we are four players. Everybody understands Monopoly, right? Or maybe not sure. anymore. Actually, <laughs> the new generation. Yeah, let, me, let me try one one more example. Imagine unemployment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Imagine there is 20% unemployment, which we will have in the next couple months. Yeah. Okay. So that means 20% of the people in the country are not working. Not technically, but you get the idea. If the government hires those, that 20% of people, if, and it hires them, it, and it hires them at a wage that is a little bit less than what the market is generally paying people. Mm-hmm. And it says, all right, you guys, you're not doing anything. Here's a bunch of shovels. Go out and build, a, I don't know, build a tunnel or fix a road. They can create that money, give it to people who are actually doing something, and some asset is created. Okay? Imagine farmland. There's a lot of farmland, and there's a lot of guys not doing anything. And they mm-hmm. say, here, mm-hmm. we're going to create money. We're going to give it to you guys who are not working. And you're going to use farmland that's not being used, plant potatoes. They can create money and pay these guys, and they create the money out of nothing, out of nothing. But this is this is what uh, modern private prisons are doing, right? They are putting people to work that could be decent works, but they working for slave labor. This is why slavery was very economic back in the day, because you're paying almost nothing, but you're getting a lot of pr- products produced. But let's but let's stick to the inflation argument because this is the argument people always get up nervous about. Well, yeah. if the government prints money, it's going to be inflationary. It's not. Inflation comes. When there's a lack of resources. Okay. So, for example, imagine there's uh, General Motors makes a million cars. And the government starts and they sell them all. And the government says, hey, we want some cars. Let's print some money and buy cars. The price of cars go up. But if General Motors can't sell 200,000 of its cars, Mm -hmm. the government can, can create money and exchange it for an asset. That is not inflationary as long as they pay the market value of it Mm. you see what i mean yeah but but again i think it's easier to use monopoly as an example because uh, in monopoly we have a limited amount of money right i mean physical bills Mm -hmm. or whatever you call it notes Mm -hmm. Uh, and they say fifty dollars hundred dollars thousand dollars whatever let's say we have four players and one guy who is the bank Mm -hmm. now there is fixed prices on the houses and the hotels in the monopoly game And, oh, I'm doing bad, you're doing good. So you're buying up all of the houses, all of the hotels, and gradually I'm becoming in debt. Now, if the guy who is the bank suddenly has 100 other Monopoly games stored in another room, so he goes into another room and he brings Mm -hmm. all that money with him, and then he starts seeding that into the game. Now, what would happen is that suddenly everybody could afford the hotels and the houses, right? So obviously those prices need to go up too. Exactly. Because right? there's a limited, because there's a, that's a very good example. There's a limit now, but imagine, imagine if we only have three players, mm-hmm. let's say we only have three players and we bring in an extra player because there's, well, yeah, or, or we, we extend the board. Because what, what, mod, what modern monetary theory is saying is 
Yes, in the case of monopoly, if we print money, it's only going to cause inflation. But what if there are parts of our society that we're not using at all? Exactly, right. Then you can print money because all the money is, it's a promise of future work. And as long as something is created, as long as something is created, we can print the money and – and put it into the system. But what you can't do... So, so wait, wait a minute. So, so it's not about the number of players, really. It's about the number of goods. Yes. Because in a monopoly, it's limited to the houses and hotels already on the board. But when you say extend it, right, then, yeah, let's say he also brings the boards <laughs> and suddenly we have like a yeah. hundred monopoly boards in front of us. In addition to a hundred times the money, then people can continue to expand creation, production, oh, uh, uncharted territory, oh, new hotels, new houses. That's what happened when the invasion of America and all this stuff, because it was unclaimed. Exactly territory and that's also and we're coming back to this at the end we'll not go there now but i'll just say it now so people will remember it when we come to it and that's exactly what will happen when we start colonize space if we haven't already done because if we because there's limited resources on earth not today that's a myth that we've exploited it today but at some point it will be limited and the only way to expand that you know from a limited economy to a unlimited one is to mm-hmm. you know expand the space we're operating in too with new resources which is why they want to mine the moon and and go to mars and all that stuff so but we'll get back to that later right now it's a distraction so so then uh, if i understand you correctly inflation will happen more if the economy is limited like if we're doing our past economy, if we have defined a value uh, with gold or silver or, 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 or maybe in a Bitcoin, crypto coin system. Where, can you hear me? Hello. There we go. That was my internet went out. Oh, okay. So what's the last thing you heard? We were talking about monopoly money. Damn. Okay. Uh-huh. So, uh, uh, but bear with me because uh, I'm getting to an important question. Mm-hmm. Let me backtrack then. <laughs> I talked and talked and you went there. So, in, in a, a monopoly, it's a limited resources, right? Right. Uh, did you hear me rant about you bringing in all the monopoly games? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We went, we did that the whole monopoly game thing, and then we talked. Yeah, exactly. That part we got through. Mm-hmm. So, so what I'm saying here to understand this: inflation will happen in an economy which is limited by a past work. If we tie it to an actual value like gold or silver. Mm-hmm. Then we have defined the value. You could say the same for crypto coins. If we have a defined system. Mm-hmm. And this much value and the people who are playing in this game, in this system, are playing for the same amount of money. Uh, in a way, I think that's a good thing because in such a system, there can't be extremes. There can't be extreme poverty or extreme wealth. But in the economy we have now, which is not tied to past work, past energy, you call it stored, stored value. Stored value. Mm-hmm. In an economy today where everything is in the future that hasn't happened yet, there it is unlimited because time is unlimited. And the same with space. Space is the board, right? Or, or the globe, if you right. like. Mm-hmm. If we start mining the moon, uh, colonizing Mars, maybe even planets further away, then it's like back in the day when Europe were depressed and then we expanded to America, uh, just took over the country, killed the inhabitants and started to uh, and we even use slave labor. Again, expansion, expansion of resources, mm-hmm. which will create a boost. So it's a kind of the same thing happening if we expand into space or into time, which is the future. And then I can't see how inflation can happen in, in such a system. Inflation can only happen when all the resources of a society or of a system are being utilized. If all but that's impossible, isn't it's it? Impo- now, uh, let me just give you an example. The, the unemployment rate in the United States is a bullshit number. Of if you want to look at really what the, the important number, it's the labor participation rate. Right, because people have two and three jobs. Uh, not, but if you look at men in the United States, the the labor participation rate, the number of men 
that participate in the labor force in the United States in the 1950s, it was something like 80 percent. Eighty percent of men participated in the economy. They worked. Now it's about 65 percent of men. Yeah, but all the women are working, too. <sighs> exactly. You you added all of these women. Right. Mm. And so what happened? There's lots and lots of men who have left the labor force. Now, if you go out and you find projects for these men, now this is what modern monetary theory says, and it's a very, this is a very important point. They say the government can find jobs for those people who are not in the labor force and pay them below market, below market, not what the market's paying, a little bit less. So you can have basically full employment, but those people that the government employs, you employ them at a lower wage, but you keep them working. You get them out of bed. You have them using their skills. And this is very important for men because when men stop working, it's very hard to get them back in the workforce. Yeah. And you prepare them. And then as the economy begins to expand, they'll leave those government jobs and go into into market jobs. But uh, I like to talk about another part of work that we don't compensate. In our societies, we consider work, for example, a guy who goes to an office and sells stocks and bonds, a bond trader, is worth millions of dollars a year. Okay? Mm -hmm. And he adds a certain value to the to the economy maybe require, you know, for liquidity, whatever you want to call it. But what about a woman that gives birth to a child? And raises that child for 18 years, 20 years. Right. That's not integrated into the economical system, even though it's That's work. That's not considered work. Yeah. We don't consider that work for some reason. And, she, and imagine, she has to buy this kid clothes, food, pay for books, often pay for education, at least higher education, no, in a lot of places, private education, give him culture, religion, language, manners. Mm -hmm. And then... This asset goes into the world and begins to function. Mm. But we don't consider all of that work that a family does to raise a child. We don't consider that work. Mm. And there's an asset on the other side. There's a human being that has been um, educated, cultured, and can work. What if, as a society, we said, okay, every, every family that has a child – and we could let the woman decide what happens to the money. She gave birth to the child. It's her mm. responsibility. Here's a thousand bucks or 500 bucks a month for your kid. And you see what I mean? That's work. Yeah. There, there's work that we could, or what about, what about families that, you know, bring their parents in to live with them, right? Mm. We could say, okay, you take care of your parents. We'll toss you another 500 bucks. They're actually, they're taking, instead of, instead of imagine the government takes this money, builds um, a center for old people, no? And then you pay all of these people to go. You see what I mean? The government can yeah. just send money. In the old days, the reason people had many children and still do in third world countries is because it's an investment for the future. Exactly. It's like a deal. The parents take care of you when you're vulnerable and helpless. And when you've grown up and become a worker and can start producing, you do that. And if you have many children, chances are that when you become old and fragile, at least one of them, if not many of them, will be able to yeah. uh, pay back that investment. Pay back that investment, sure. Yes, and uh, that's why the most effective way to, to battle overpopulation, which I don't believe in anyway, but that's another story. It's not even a matter of belief, it's a matter of facts. But mm -hmm. the best way is actually to battle poverty, because many think erratically, they think, okay, there's too many people, then we shouldn't help them out of poverty, you know, let them die or whatever. But that's actually the opposite. It leads to the opposite. If you lift people out of poverty, they start reducing the number of children. So often things are opposite of what people think. And it's the same here when we talk about the economy. Yeah. And, and just, just to bring it kind of all back to what's going on today. So, I mean, in the last month, We've had this coronavirus, which is now – it's basically bringing to a screeching halt an enormous part of the economy. And mm. people are out on the street. And Trump – I think it was yesterday they're coming up with a bill for a trillion dollars. Now, this is just the federal government. We're not talking about the Fed. The Fed has been spending 
Oh my God. It's been like what a couple, it was like 85, a hundred billion dollars a week. They were printing in the repo market. So governments create an enormous amount of money. They pump it into the economy. Now, many will say, well, who's going to pay for it? And I'm going to give them the answer. Nobody's going to pay for it. There is absolutely no need to pay for this. Absolutely no need. But couldn't you say that the collective is paying for it? Because if the feds, uh, they're creating money out of thin air. That's what they're doing. They're just increasing mm-hmm. the numbers in the computer. And, and that's like flooding the game with monopoly right. money from other monopoly games. But if the work was not... Uh, I mean, in a monopoly game, it would be obvious inflation Im- immediately, right? Everybody would see it. But like you're saying, they're expanding the resources, they're expanding the production, they're expanding the board, so we don't see it. But exactly, but, this yes. is a time where think about think about it as as a farm with lots of orange trees. Mm-hmm. Now, when you have a lot of healthy workers out there picking all those oranges, there's no need for the government to print money and pay people to go pick oranges when they're already getting picked. Mm-hmm. But all of a sudden, half the workers get sick or can't go out and pick the oranges, and all the government's simply doing is is paying people to go pick those oranges. Now, what will happen with this money? This is what will happen with the money. The the federal the the Federal Reserve will create the money will create the money and send it to the treasury. The treasury will send it out to Americans. Then the treasury, the same amount, will create bonds. And those bonds can be bought by the central bank. That's all it is. Now, if in the future all of this money stirring around starts to cause prices to rise, the federal I mean, the central bank, the Federal Reserve, will start selling those bonds that they bought, selling them, sucking up that money again. You see what I mean? The money gets sucked up, and then it gets destroyed. Mm. And it's destroyed. So the, what, what happens is you can create money, and then you can simply destroy it. You can remove the liquidity. That's how you control – because what people have to understand is taxes, taxes – and monetary monetary policy through bonds that is only to just keep the value of the currency strong it has nothing to do with paying for things hmm. taxes don't exist to pay for things they exist we put taxes in place to keep it one a demand on dollars because there's a demand on them it gives them their value and to maintain the interest rates That's the only reason we have taxes. That's the only reason. In a way, it's a good thing because it. In a way, it's a good thing because it means that. um, Actually, it means that you could get rid of taxes. But I'd say there's no there's no need to have there's no absolutely no need. Now it's important to have some taxes because you need to have. You need to have a monetary balance if you just print, print, print money. Now, let me give you an example. In colonial times, well, the colonial, in the 19th century in America, there were many dollars. Each bank issued its own dollars, papered money, paper dollars, right? Mm-hmm. And some governments, what they would actually do, state governments, is this, this is fascinating what they would do. They would print up this money, right? Mm-hmm. Spend it. And then they would collect taxes because they needed to keep a balance. And when those taxes came in, those bills, you know what they would do with the bills? They would burn them. Mm. Literally destroy them. They would literally burn the bills so they didn't get the monetary system out of whack. They kept a certain balance. You see what I mean? Mm. That's what – when you pay taxes – this is fascinating. When you pay taxes, that money go winds up at – the Federal Reserve in a balance sheet and it gets wiped out. It doesn't pay for anything. You see what I mean? Mm. It just gets sapped out. There's a debit and a credit and it disappears. But in moments like this, this administration will spend in my what if you count what this what the what the um, Federal Reserve is going to print and what the federal government is going to print through the Federal Reserve, it's probably in the ten trillion dollars. I'm t- in the next 18 months, they'll probably print 10 trillion. Now, but, but if that do- if that doesn't devalue it won't. the worth 
yep. of money and make the entire collective poorer, I mean the 99%, then the bill is kind of pushed to the future. Then it's kind of enslaving future generations. But, that's, but how that's a mistake because it's not enslaving anybody. The debt is, it is, is not real. So how to understand. What, what I mean is think of, think of Gen- General Motors. Let me give you an example. Mm-hmm. General Motors just closed all of its factories. Now, can you imagine that? Yeah, I can. I mean, but that's kind of, it's kind of for an American. You know, we always had that expression as a kid, you know, what's good for General Motors is good for America. Mm-hmm. You know, union jobs and these guys got benefits. They just closed all their factories. In- the last one is closed. No, but for the coronavirus, I mean, they shut down. Oh, right. Oh, okay. Okay. So they have all of these factories that are working. These are thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs. Mm. And they had to shut down the factories because they couldn't keep all these folks working and keep them without getting infected. Mm. So General Motors shut down all those factories. But get to the point. (laughs) Yeah. So the point is. Who's going to be buying cars in the next six months? Is anyone going to be buying cars? I don't think right. so. Nobody, no. So no, you got factories no. that don't work, and you got people who aren't buying cars. And this is just we're talking about cars. Imagine food, wheat, all of this. If the government prints money, tons, and sends everyone two thousand dollars a month, and they say, "Go, go buy a car," and General Motors says, "Yeah, you know, maybe we'll bring these guys back to work." As long as that money goes to a guy who goes and buys a car and there's an asset there and the economy keeps flowing, that debt that the government has, that's not going to cause inflation until we get close to full capacity. When you get to full capacity, you know what I mean? When you get to the monopoly board and and everyone's bought everything, then it causes inflation. But we're we're near that. No, no, no. I think it's impossible to get near that for two reasons. Because uh, in reality, there is no limit. There is no limit in time. As long as they found a way to involve the future, the future isn't going to stop in like 10 minutes from now. So it's the same as space. There's no limit in space either. Space is full of resources, exactly. which means that they can keep this going. But if I understand this correctly, this is actually the opposite of the trickle down model that we've been. Yeah, this is the trickle up. Yeah. <laughs> the paradigm we've been suffering under for so long is the trickle down. That's Obama's idea of give all the money to the top and somehow everybody at the bottom eventually will get some crumbles, which doesn't, it never happens. If anything, they just store it away in bank accounts and they don't even invest. Exactly, because that's it. It's exactly it. But this means that if the government paid, let's say UBI or whatever, Mm -hmm. as much as they wanted to all people all the time, the economy would boost. It would be a golden age. If I understand correctly, this philosophy, it would bring us if they did it. Imagine in an ideal world that they did it correctly. It would bring us to our almost full potential. To, the, you wouldn't want to go to 100 percent because then you would start to get inflation. You'd want to get to about 95 percent okay. capacity. Now, now, what you said about Obama is so true, because what Obama did instead of saving, imagine there was. 11 million foreclosures, 5 million families he kicked out of their houses. What he did was say, kick them out. It's not a problem. But we, the federal government through the central bank, the Federal Reserve, will create money, which is called quantitative easing, and we will buy those mortgages from the banks and we'll save the banks. And that money did trickle. It did. I mean, I have to, it did trickle down to a certain extent and the economy kind of crawled back a little bit. You know, people were getting along. No, it didn't. Tri- Look, the corporations and the banks and the people who did the criminal acts, they were bailed out. Yes. But people, uh, you know, the middle class was almost er- eradicated and it still, it, it never got back up on the feet. So, so how can you say that it actually trickled down? Now, no, people no, but are out, 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 trust me. Six months ago in the United States, you want to get a job, you can get a job and you can make these, you know, you can, I mean, it's not low paying. I, Al, I've lived in Spain for many years. Mm-hmm. Try and get a job in Spain. No, really. I mean, I have, I have, I, you know, you could have, ed- you're an educated person in the United States in six months ago looking for a job, you can find a job and you can make decent money. I'm not saying it was a perfect system, but the economy was working. It functioned. And what did Trump do? Trump just came in and people don't understand this. 
He just cut taxes and said, let's dump a ton more money in the system, and it's a big mm. party. Yeah, but in he, the economy, he, he, he cut them for the rich, not, not the worker guy. But the, rich, but the rich invest, and when they invest, that money trickles down. I'm not saying it's an ideal system or it's a perfect system, but the economy was working. No economist in the world. I have yet to see evidence for that trickle down, and even the investment. Have there been a lot of inv- innovation now, and now, investment? Look for a job in the United States in 2009. Mm. No, I mean, go out and you know, open the newspaper or you know, Craigslist and look for a job. Hard. There were no jobs. Yeah, yeah. Hard? <laughs> Are you fucking kidding? It was a fucking disaster. <laughs> yeah. In 2016, in 2000, you know, last October, you could go to New York if you're you know reasonably qualified and you could get a job. I'm not saying it was a perfect system, but you could get by. You mm-hmm. could survive. 2009 was the apocalypse. But are you talking about flipping burgers? I mean, what kind of jobs are we talking about? Because in the 50s, when you said 80% of the men were employed, they were having careers uh, in the meaning that many of them would have this job until they were retired and they were paying not just for themselves. They were pay- hang on, hang on. They were paying for the children. They were paying for the wife. They were buying houses, cars, all this stuff. Okay. It was a living wage. Today, people are, are living paycheck to paycheck, and many families in America are having two or three jobs, and both uh, are employed, and they don't have time for anything else. I mean, that, no, you're right. If no, you're living you, in a bubble, you don't see it. No, I'm not but living th- in a. Bu- I'm not living in a bubble. I've lived in America. I know. I know what it, it's like. No, but what I'm saying is, you said it doesn't work, and it does work. The trickle down is so, enough trickles down to keep society functioning. Society was not functioning in 2009. In March of 2009, at the bottom of everything, it was a fucking disaster. But then Trump could just pay off uh, the, all, all the corporations now and all the banks. And well, that's what he's going to do. That's what he's going to do. No, he's paying money directly in the pocket of of people. No, but he's giving, but he's giving five hundred billion to the airlines, to the ships, to the hotels. Yeah, he does the that bank, too. How the banks have been getting a hundred billion a week, a week. The, the Fed has been printing in the fall. But yeah, but what I'm saying is the trickle down does work, and I'm saying it works perfectly, or that it's just, or it's equal, but. It it works well enough. Remember what I said, the second bullet in the gun? Mm-hmm. That was what Obama did. He shot that bullet, quantitative easing, quantitative easing, and it worked. I mean, it survived. The country survived. Yeah. Hey, you have to explain but this. But now... Look, you have to explain the quantitative easing thing. Mm-hmm. Do that and we'll take a break. But for this debate, I just have to say... I think it's the opposite that works. And it's not just something I think. I've, I've heard economists explain this very perfectly, but I'm inept to, mm-hmm. to uh, retell it now in a convincing way. But basically what they're saying is, if you take the money and you put it in the pocket of the people, the people will go out and buy these things. And that's how the top people get it back because they... You know, the corporations control the stuff. They make the cars. Now, if you give people the money... Mm-hmm. in a crisis so that they can buy bread and uh, you know the money starts circulating to each other but eventually it goes up to the top because the top is sucking the profit all the time i'm i'm not saying it's a bad thing i'm saying it's a that's how it works but if you give it directly to the top the economy will not uh, blossom but that's but that's not how it, that's not how it functioned in the last the last cycle from the 2008 crisis till today yeah it went all to the top. And that's why we still, yes. why did we start talking about in 2000? Remember in around 2010, 2011, people started to talk about the 1%, the uber rich. Yeah. This is that period from, it's basically the Obama years. What, exactly. what, quantitative, what quantitative easing is, is simply the central bank needs to inject money into the economy. So what they do is they print money. They print money. They just – to think of a debit and a credit, mm-hmm. right? They print money and they go out and they buy government bonds and they buy – in the case of the United States, they bought mortgages basically from banks. So mm-hmm. the banks had mortgages that were worthless. Nobody wanted them. In the government – I guess we, I guess we could just call quantitative easing for bailouts because that's what it is, right? It's just it bailing not- out. No, not no, no, because this, they're creating money 
and going out and buying asset, financial assets, not real things. They're not going out and buying factories mm. or cars or trucks. They're just going by and buying securities, pieces of paper, mm. and creating money and buying pieces of paper that didn't have a lot of value. Well, in the case of bonds, they had a certain amount of value, but they're, they're creating money. That money goes straight to the top, hmm. straight to the top. So if you look at the United States from 2009 till 2020, okay, mm-hmm. the biggest bull market in U.S. history, the greatest stock market in history was from March 2009 to two months ago. Hmm. There was no inflation. If you look at no. consumer inflation – Consumer price inflation, it was almost nothing. It was like 1%, 2%. Hmm. What happened? All of that money went to the rich, and there was an enormous amount of asset inflation. And all of these people got incredibly rich. Exactly. The rich got so rich. But, Al, enough trickled down to stop the yes. plebes from revolution. Yeah, that, I agree about that. You see what I my, mean? Yeah. Enough, enough got down there to keep them calm, and they had in a wealth that we may never see again in our lifetimes, the wealth that these people had in that period. It was mm. unbelievable how much money they had. Yes. Unbelievable. Yes, I agree. But the, the big point is, if you go back to the Clinton era, mm-hmm. you, uh, you you can't compare it because, uh, no, because in the Clinton era, before 2001, when everything went down the drain, mm-hmm. there was real wealth in your country. Yeah. Normal people could afford having two cars, cabin, boat. They would have a big house. Uh, they own their own house. There was a middle class. After 2008 especially and up to now, people are surviving and they are uh, uh, docile in a way, but uh, and this crisis is shaking that up, but it's it's not the same. People are much poorer. No, and, and, I, and, and I, I think it's that, because I can explain it really easily. In 1991, or actually 1992, Clinton comes into office. Right? Mm-hmm. You had an absolute revolution, the digital revolution. The, the information revolution. Mm. So from about 1992, 93, when that whole thing started, if you go to, say, 2000, that was one of the most creative, incredible periods, I would say, in human history. I, I agree. But there was also so, good times but, in the 80s under Reagan. It, no, but that, but, yuppie that, but, time. That, but, but that yuppie time in the 80s was much more like the Obama period. It yeah. was just money creating money. But if you take that period from 1992 to about 2000, mm. so much – how can I say this? So much was created of enormous value mm. that everyone got rich because yeah. we were actually creating something. In the 1980s, it was just assets. It was a bubble. You know, leverage yeah. this, leverage that. And from 2008 till basically 2020, it was just print money like crazy. Mm. Central banks printing. But what happens? This is what happens. At some point, you can't keep printing. Because if you keep printing, what's the stock market going to go to? Is it going to go to a hundred million? What's the value of an apartment going to be in Shanghai or in uh, I don't know in San Francisco? What is it going to be a trillion dollars to buy an apartment? Mm. You see what I mean? Inflation. At some point, all you're doing is just asset inflation. Mm. Look at Japan. Japan is the perfect example of this. In 1990, Japan was 60 percent. 60% of US GDP. So it was 60% the size of the US economy. Hmm. And today it's like 20%. It was just a big financial bubble that just burst. Yeah. But from the end of the war till 1990, the Japanese created an enormous amount of value, car companies, electronics. But then they got it, they got this all of this money and they didn't know what to do with it. They created a, a financial bubble and they haven't gotten out of it yet. <laughs> So what I mean is money, when money – when you create money on one side of the ledger and on the other side of the ledger, you actually create something real, it's not a problem. But in the, there's a really good example of this. If you go to a bank – imagine you go to a bank and you want to you want a mortgage and you say, I'm going to build a house on a piece of land. And the bank says, okay, I'm going to create $100,000. Go build your house. And you build a house? You actually do something with that money? Mm-hmm. That's not inflationary, and that's actually good for society. It allows 
it gives people the opportunity to be creative and to do things. Mm. But but when some rich guy says goes to the bank and says, hey, give me a million dollars. I want to go buy Al's house now because now it's worth a million dollars. He didn't create anything. Mm. And that money is just that's, then you get you just get asset inflation. You're just pumping the price of things. Up, right. And you get a bubble. Yeah. And that's what happened. And what this if you look at cycle theory, what's happening now is the whole bubble is bursting. The mm. whole bubble is bursting. All of this debt, which is healthy, kind of in the long run, it has to get washed out. It has to get. Washed it's out. a default back to alt central delete, right? And and you know it's really interesting. Trump said the other day that, um, and I'm not saying that Trump is some genius. This is he has no other option. Hmm. You can't lower interest rates. You can't do quantitative. E- Imagine quantitative easing now. Imagine if Trump said, "Well, we're going to print a lot of money and buy bonds, and uh, we're going to keep the, get the stock market up." People would be like, "Yeah, but I'm starving." You, you see what I mean? They, yeah. You can't do. You just got to go and give the money. So he has it's, to do, do what Obama should have done back in uh, oh exactly. But what did what did he say the other day? What did he say, Obama? Yeah, you you start your sentence with. Uh, oh no! Yeah. So um. Oh, I, I lost my train of thought. But anyway, he said. Um. What did Trump say? Oh, I I lost it. I got I got lost. Well, I guess it was about uh, giving out money directly to the people. But you know what what people don't understand, and let's close part one with this. Mm-hmm. They don't understand what happened in '08 because in '08 Obama had to go to the Congress and get their approvement of printing money out of thin air to bail out everything. Uh, but many Not- people don't know what happened after that. You know how they put into law that you can do it automatically. Can you explain that? And and what has been going on for a while, even before Corona? You mean with with TARP when he went in in the whole the whole TARP thing? No, what, but what, really, what happened? What happened in two thousand eight when the financial markets completely collapsed? There was two choices. One was bail out the people. So Obama could have said, you know what? On a legal technicality, we could get into this. On a legal technicality, you can't foreclose on these people because you don't you don't have the deeds to their houses. Mm. So you can't foreclose on them. So the people are going to keep their houses and you investment banks are all going to go bankrupt. And he would have given those people their houses. And modern monetary theory said their solution to 2008 would be stop all taxes for a year. Mm. So for one year, don't no taxes. Nobody pays any federal income tax. There's no federal. But, but hang on, they wouldn't necessarily go bankrupt. He could just nationalize the banks and then privatize them when the crisis is over. But how these are investment banks? They why do you, why nationalize them? Let them die. Yeah, I agree. I mean, all they do, all they do, I agree. You know, it's, it's bond issuing bonds, and I mean they don't do anything. Yes, yes, yeah, no, I agree. So he said, okay, you got this capitalism. You win, you lose. You guys made a shitload of money, and now you fucked up. Yeah. Sorry for the language. And you lose it all. And we're giving the people the money because, you know, I'm power to the people, hope, and all this BS. Plus, they were criminals. And Obama, he would have been a hero. Yeah. I was hope. I remember. I voted for the guy. I was thrilled. I was like. Yeah, but, but look, Wall Street uh, controlled him from day one. From day so one. there was nothing to hope for. Exactly. Yeah. And, then, you know, he brings in Larry Summers. The architect of the whole disaster. Mm, Tim Guy. He brings him in. Now, as, if folks who are interested in modern monetary theory, highly recommend Larry Summers wrote an op-ed in the New York Times about MMT. And he really attacked it. At the same time that Ray Dalio, the manager of the largest hedge fund in the world, world said we need it. And Mario Draghi said we're probably ready for some MMT. So this was in the, all in the last six months. Wow. And the last week, when Trump said we're gonna we're gonna have a trillion dollar bailout for the country, not one politician asked where's the money coming from, no. and they shouldn't, because the resources are there. You should what we should ask politician is politicians. When you ask a politician for something, if the politician says we don't have the resources. That's a legitimate answer. We don't have the money is not. Mm. If you say we want to fly to Pluto and the politician says, you know, we don't have the resources to do that. Right. That's a legitimate answer. But if, yeah. if you say, you know, we want to put a base on the moon and he says we don't have the money, yeah. that's not a legitimate answer. Very good example. But what I was getting at is that in 08, Congress had to approve 
the uh, wild printing of money to bail out everything. But they put into law, many people don't know this, they put into law that in the future you don't have to go to the Congress and get permission. And half a year ago or something, it all started to go, it was underreported in the media, of course. But the stock started to crash and they started to pump Mm. desperately in money. And you know about this because we talked about this uh, some time ago. And after that, they've been printing and printing and printing and pumping and pumping and pumping money into the system. So this is, this I think is important for people to know about because it's so underreported in mainstream media. I think what you're referring to is that the central bank can buy, go into the stock market and buy stocks directly. Right. Is that but, it? Uh, yes. But they need the money to do it, right? Because there was That's a my very interesting question today at Trump's news conference. Oh, it was fascinating. Somebody said, are you, do you, Mr. Trump, do you recommend that the, um, the Federal Reserve actually begins to buy equities? They've never done that. The Fed has never actually bought stock. Well, directly. They have done indirectly. But directly? Buy stock. No, they just buy uh, treasuries and um, and mortgage-backed securities. Oh, so they become owner of the stocks? And you know what Trump said? It was Jeez. so funny. He said, yeah. yeah, he said, I think that's a good idea. I think that's a good – we should buy – we should start buying – because look at the stock market. Yeah. He said, yeah, I think it was a, It was so funny to watch him. And you know he was thinking maybe they'll buy you know, some, of my, some of my companies. No? <laughs> see if I can get – I can see his mind thinking, oh, my <laughs> yeah. God, I can make a fortune here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but the point is uh, in order for them to buy it, they have to print money for it. Right, right. They would just print yeah, it. Yeah, and that's what they're doing. Well, let, me, let me give you an example. When, when a bank – think this is, this is one example that can make it clear how banks operate. When a bank – buys a building. So imagine a bank wants to expand and buy a building. Do you know what they do? All they do is they they go to the guy who has the building and they say, give me the deed for that building. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And let's say it's a million dollars and they print, they create the million dollars and there they got it. They've got it balanced. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. They That's what's called expanding the balance sheet. They just expanded their balance sheet by a million dollars. They took the deed for the building. They created, remember, out of nothing, they created the million dollars, gave it to the guy, and there they've got it. They've got a building, and they've got the million dollars that they created. It's done. Fantastic. That's how the central bank buys stocks. Hmm. They just expand because they don't say they never say, oh, the the Fed's printed a shitload of money today. No, they say the Federal Reserve is going to expand its balance sheet. And you're like, nobody's like, what the fuck does that mean? Mm -hmm. That's all it means is they printed a lot of money. And on the other side of the ledger, they have whatever asset they bought. You see what I mean? This is a way to take over the world. (laughs) And the wild thing is it's, it's a private institution, isn't it? It actually is. It's it's owned. It's not owned by the American people. It's owned by the banks in this in the Federal Reserve system. And who owns the banks? Who owns the banks? The shareholders of the banks would own the banks. So who are the biggest shareholders? Ooh, now there you go. I, because I, this is very hard to to track down. Many people have tried. Mm-hmm. But there was a book uh, a few years ago called The Superclass, not a conspiracy book, a mainstream book. Mm-hmm. Superclass is... Oh, I know. I think it's... I've heard about this guy. Yeah, it's 6,000 people uh, divided yes. up in 400 families. Mm-hmm. Not only old money. There's a lot of new new too. Mm-hmm. Um, and most of them are unknown people. I mean, some of them are, of course, the usual suspects, but many of them are relatively unknown. And I think it's important to start identifying these people, these 0.1 percenters. Oh, yeah. Because exactly. like, like Jerry Myron said, who are these bastards? Let's, because if we know who they are and can, you know, we, we have the power of being the many. We have the real power. But they are hiding behind companies, behind cartels, behind anonymous. And that's how they can get away with a lot, lot of this stuff, you know. But, you know, I think a lot in t- a lot of times in our world, there we, we do have, and I have the same tendency to um to go to this conspiracy side. No, 
And 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 I I've been on many. I remember I was on one show and the guy asked me. He goes, "Yeah, Robert. So is it the Jesuits, the Jews, <laughs> the Masons?" And I yeah. was like, "What are you talking about, dude? It's James. It's you know Bank of America, Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs. I mean, they're right there. They're they're looking at you right yeah, there. They, and he's like, "Well, do they put robes on?" I was like, "I don't know if they put robes on, but I mean, those are the guys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. No, but at the end of that equation, there are real people. That's the point. And and that's not a conspiracy. It's just how stuff is structured. Yeah. There is six. 6,000 people. But people are too lazy to just understand this. If we understood this system, we would tell our politicians, you know what? You're all going to send us a thousand dollars a month. You're going to wipe out the federal debt. I'm never paying my taxes on interest <laughs> again, yeah. again. Yeah, yeah. And if you start more fucking more war, I'm going to crash the whole system. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, I wish. Agreed. And you could have that in six months. If people just said, you know what? They're always going to be rich people, and you can be as rich as you want, but first you're going to cover our nut. Then you guys can go and have your golf clubs and do all this fancy stuff. But people are too stupid. They're too stupid. <laughs> it's that simple. Yeah, but with the old system, with the uh, past work system, there wouldn't be extreme poverty or extreme uh, well, richness. Well, there would be extreme poverty. I mean, it could be, but, but it's easier to stop it because it's a finite amount of values, Right. So we it would just, be impossible. Yeah. It would be absolutely impossible. Yeah, so we, we were just fighting about how much each should have. And if too many get too little, a revolution will come. So it's better for the system. And same with if we had like a crypto system, you know, with, with, with a defined value and everybody takes part of that. But with this system, Keynes system, where everything is projected into the future mm -hmm. in time or in outer space, <laughs> if you will, because there's no more new frontiers on Earth, then you do get you, these extremes. You could have extreme wealth, so much wealth that it's impossible to understand. But you also get iPhones and Google and YouTube. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, that. Be, no, no, that, that's not tied up to what. No, no, no. The, because from the goal, but because going back to your, if you limit it to past work, you would limit potential. You, that that is true. You would you would limit things to what was already done. And in this system, you do open up an enormous amount of potential. I mean, think about our society. You would just limit how much value we would put to the new creativity, but there's still going to be like if, if I in the old system, if I have enough money to function and get by, nobody's stopping me from inventing computers. You see what I mean? I'm just adding assets to the old system. Yeah, I, no, I see what you mean. So I don't agree that, that it is tied up to creativity. It's tied up to how much wealth is going around. But it, it, I see what you mean. And if we did it that way, we would have to completely redefine what money is in the sense that imagine, imagine you, I, I needed something translated into Norwegian. Hmm. And so I said, hey, Al, can you translate this into Norwegian and I'll send you, well, I'll send you 20 credits. And you say, OK, you see what I mean? You created something, a translation, mm -hmm. and I created its equivalent value in a credit system that we all more or less believed. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I exchanged it. So in, in that's but that's a that's a that's a deep philosophical yeah. discussion. <laughs> about what, how to unleash the potential. And, and I agree with you that we could come up with a system that was um, complete. Uh, it would be completely different idea of what money is. And money would constantly be created every time, every time something was created of value. And we would have to come up with a system yeah. that we would, it would be like a blockchain and we would all have to sort of, I all agree that, yeah, there is some value here. Okay, we can add, you see what I mean? We mm. can add that value. But mm. it has to be agreed upon by at least a consensus. Well, it's, it is a, if it's defined, then it would be a consensus if everybody bought into it. Exactly. Because imagine imagine then uh, somebody else says, hey, I say, yeah, Al did a great job. I gave him 20 credits for the translation. And you did another translation. It was shit. And the guy said, I'm not uh, – it, you see what I mean? Then eventually, five values. Yeah, exactly. It begins to go. So the system could self-regulate, mm. and it would be completely decentralized. Exactly. And it would. That's the genius of blockchain. The genius of blockchain is creating a monetary system 
that's absolutely decentralized. But that that's going to take a while. But what we have now, the opportunity we have now is to eliminate. Oh, I, and I, this is what I was going to say about Trump. Trump said no evictions and no, no foreclosures. Exactly. So there now, those no, I'm, I'm telling you, trust me, the no foreclosures, what's going to happen is it's going to be that debt is going to get written off. So those mortgages, the central bank simplement, sim, simply just eliminates both sides of the ledger. The bank doesn't lose any. Remember, the bank loses nothing. The only thing the bank loses is the future interest. Right. But they say, look. Let's just eliminate all these mortgages. We're going to eliminate all the, the national debts, the local debts. This will be the cleansing of all of that debt. And then we start again. Just so people, I know this is a dark time and it's going to get darker, but what's coming is a wonderful period. Yeah. It's the spring. Yeah. And we, this is the tunnel. And we're going, there's going to be a point where it's going to be very dark. And hopefully most of us will get through this. And when we do, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful period. I agree. It's, it's a new spring. And I think huh? we'll have a completely – I think we're going to have a new type of leadership because we've lost faith in the old leadership and new leaders will emerge, new ideas. The old ideas, these toxic ideas are going to get left by the wayside. It's going to be a wonderful period, a great <laughs> period. Yeah, from your mouth to the ears of the gods. Now let's take a break. <laughs> let's Sounds let's good. take a break. And and you know it's so beautiful that you're saying this 20th of March tomorrow is spring equinox. So amen and hallelujah for the new spring. <laughs> But let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll go deeper into very interesting aspects of this, the black economy going to discuss UBI a little. You're going to explain further modern monetary theory system. And uh, yeah, we're just going to expand on much of what we already discussed. So stay tuned, folks. All of our files are free and will remain free. If you like the show, you can show support by donating $1 to help with expenses. Just use the PayPal link on our website, YouTube channel, or Facebook page. Thanks. Thanks. 